Hi, I'm Dave Berg, former producer of The Tonight Show with Jay Leno and author of the book Behind the Curtain, an insider's view of Jay Leno's Tonight Show. And you're listening to my interview with Elaine Goodman on gogoodman.com.au. You've got a journalistic background, both local and national, with the O'Reilly Factor, USA Today, Huffington Post, Reader's Digest, and the list goes on. Did you always have a soft spot for comedy? No, I, I didn't, uh, because it, what, what you're talking about is publications that I've written for since I've been at The Tonight Show, but I started out um, b- basically as a journalist. Um, at, you know, I worked at the Kansas City Star, a newspaper. I, wor- I worked at uh, uh, te- actually television stations throughout the Midwest and ended up at NBC News for 10 years as a writer and a producer. Right, right. So, yeah, you, you, so... So I got yeah got a little bit confused. That's after your Tonight Show stint, but before that, you were at NBC News for ten years in LA. Uh, in that, the... That's correct. So I had been a journalist for many years before uh, comedy was. It was not even um, it was not even on my radar. Right, right. So before we get any further, I'll, I'll just point out that you are the author of the book Behind okay. the Curtain: An Insider's View to Jay Leno's Tonight Show. And you were a producer on The Tonight Show for 18 years, I believe. Now, when you heard The Tonight Show was moving in down the hall from you at NBC, was Jay Leno a household name? Yes. He wasn't a household name to the extent that he was after he got the job. But at that time, he had already been guest hosting on The Johnny Carson Show, which preceded Jay's stint. He had been guest hosting... Um, on the Johnny Carson show for seven years. Right, right. But he hadn't had like an apprenticeship, like, for example, Jimmy Fallon had late night for, what was it, like two or three years before he got the Tonight Show? He, he didn't have his own show, but he would guest host once a week for Johnny Carson for seven years. Right. Do you, rem- do you remember walking, this was early on in the book, do you remember walking down the hall with your resume in hand, building up the courage to ask for a job on arguably the biggest sh- show in the world? Because you did say you, you got fired from NBC News, unfortunately, but that happens to anybody, especially in the entertainment industry. What was going through your head walking down the hallway to the biggest show in the world? I felt very, very intimidated on two fronts. First of all, I was intimidated by the idea of going down and knocking on the door of the most iconic show on American television. That was the first fear. I I felt I was out of my league. I didn't even have a background in entertainment. And I was also intimidated at the idea of not doing it because my wife had strongly urged me to go down and apply for the job um, and, and didn't really want me to come home unless I had applied for the job. So I was I was fighting those t- you know I was intimidated on both ends and I figured it was it was probably an easier choice to go down and just apply for the job than to go home and say I didn't look for work that day. Now before we get further into I guess the Tonight Show because I, I want to find out how the Tonight Show actually works because it's something we don't really have here in Australia and we haven't really ever had something that's as iconic as the Tonight Show. But before we do. You have a bachelor in political science and a master's in journalism, which doesn't immediately scream comedy. So how did you find the transition from serious news to comedy? I I think I just, you just learned it, right? You're just around it and you just learn that that comedy is not just something that you tell jokes. There's actually some structure to it and, and... um, there, there are techniques that you learn when you tell jokes and when you, when, when you tell anecdotes. Of course, um, m- many of the same uh, principles apply to journalism. You tell a story with a beginning, a middle, and an end. You keep it brief. You get to the point right, a- right away. So a-, a lot of those same principles apply. But, but a-, a comedy has extra elements, such as, this, uh, such as the element of surprise, misdirection, uh, that sort of thing. Now, let's get deep into how The Tonight Show actually works because, yeah, it's, not many people would actually know what goes on behind the scenes if they haven't read the book or if they haven't watched a, a lot of The Tonight Show. From an entertainment perspective, 
You said Johnny Carson was very focused on entertainment-related guests, but Jay expanded this to po- politicians, authors, athletes, and journalists, which was one of the big changes from Johnny's Tonight Show. Was the diversity an instant success, or did, did it depend on the particular guest? It took a long time. Um, it took a long time to establish that we should expand the types of guests that we had on the show. Um, when we followed Johnny, who had been on the air for 30 years, we, um, there was a pattern there of having people from the entertainment field. So when I came to the table and suggested other types of guests, it wasn't particularly, I'm not saying I got a hostile reaction, but um, my ideas definitely didn't stick. And it, it took a good five years, actually. So when I would suggest somebody outside the field of entertainment, that my colleagues would actually, you know, listen and say, oh, that's a good idea. It took a while to establish that, you know, the show could move in a different direction and do well. So who was the first out-of-the-box uh, guest that you suggested that they actually agreed with? Do you remember? That's um, that's a really good one. It was a... It was a it was a, a really off-the-wall suggestion, and I don't know if this name will mean anything to Aussies, but does Rush Limbaugh mean anything? I know the name, just because it's such a okay. unique name. <laughs> he's, a, he's, a, he's a conservative radio commentator in America, very influential. And mm-hmm. people either love him or they hate him. He just has that effect on people. And he had a huge listening audience, and I just threw out his name, um, and I got a lot of resistance to it. But my feeling was, you know what? This guy has 20 million people listening to him every week on his daily show, or every day, I should say. This guy's a force to be reckoned with. Even if you don't like him, many people do. So let's think about it. It took, you know... I got total resistance to having him as a guest for a couple of years. They finally agreed to have him on. What was the turning point for them? I think the turning point was when my colleagues would hear from their fam, from people in their families, hey, have you thought about having Rush Limbaugh on? When they started hearing it from people that they knew, not people in Hollywood, right, but regular people outside of Hollywood. I'm just pulling that one out of a hat. But so you mentioned Bill O'Reilly. Does that name ring a bell? I'm, yeah, I know who Bill O'Reilly is. Okay, that's another example. Uh, when I first pitched him, the thought was, ooh, he's a little strident. He's a little too opinionated. I don't know if that would be a good fit for Jay, right? So, again, my, my point was, that's right. He's strident. He's opinionated. He can also be humorous. He can also tell some fantastic stories. And isn't it good to, to have people on who have sharp opinions? Before we get into, I've got some specific guest questions and related to different situations. I want to know, how, do you, how did you balance, because The Tonight Show is on five, is on, well, was on and still is on five nights a week, how did you balance preparing for guests you'd already booked, but also booking more guests in advance? How, how many shows in advance did you have to book for? No, I don't think there was any set number, but the movie industry basically determined how far out we would book guests because we would get the release dates to the big films. And, of course, we wanted to book all the big stars for all the big films. So that was usually, uh, you know, th- three, four months out. You'd start, you'd start um, calling agents and publicists and film companies. Uh, but, but that was driven by the film industry. Early in the book, you talk about the lack of spontaneity in late-night television with the story of taking The Tonight Show to Boston for the finale of Cheers and doing a live broadcast. But I think spontaneity is usually a good thing in that nobody suspects it, and you you mentioned that's that's what comedy is. And you mentioned later in the book about Letterman doing an interview with a roughed up looking Joaquin Phoenix... Uh, which was said to be spontaneous, but was actually planned. So where's the balance between having that spontaneity, like like this interview is, because you don't know what I'm going to ask you, but also having it scripted so nothing can go wrong? Um, uh, what my, my point was, just by the nature of the beast, 
there's only so much spontaneity you can do in television, entertainment television, because you have lots of people working on any given show. The director needs to know what camera angles, what shots to do. You need to rehearse a lot. So you don't have the benefit of spontaneity like you do as a radio interviewer. You just have to work around it and try to make it look as spontaneous as it can. And sometimes spontaneity does actually happen, but I'm just saying it's a little more planned than most people would be aware of or, and, or be comfortable with. So it's more from a production side rather than an actual entertainment on-screen side. Yeah, you have to be aware of the many PF that the audio people have to be in the loop, the director has to be in the loop, the camera people have to be in the loop. Jay has to be in the loop. You know, he, he doesn't like surprises either. The guests have publicists that get bent out of shape. If, if you ask certain questions, it, the, the, it's, the, that, those are the things you're dealing with. Right. Now, if we move on to specific guest situations, you mentioned that The Tonight Show became the place where people would come to apologize for wh- whatever they've done wrong. And this, <laughs> this was... Um, Evident from when Hugh Grant came on, I think it was I think he said in like 1994 or something, when he was caught, uh, basically, uh, for lack of a better term, banging a hooker in the back of a car, and he came on to apologise. Why was it Hugh Grant, like a, a British rom-com actor who's probably never going to be up there on the Oscars list? Why was he the one that was the game changer for the Tonight Show that gave you the ratings? Uh, advantage over Letterman and made you that place where people come to apologize. Why, why was he so relevant? Because the, he, he was on an upswing. He was the new it kid in Hollywood at that time. And he had just done his first Hollywood movie, not British movie, but, uh, you know, Hollywood movie that he, that he wanted to mo- promote and he was a pretty b- big name. And when he was caught on Sunset Boulevard, you know, with a hooker in the car, the story got out there and it became viral worldwide when the word viral wasn't even a word in the context you and I know it. It was a worldwide story. Right, yes. Yeah. So it, it, it just amazes me that some, some kid, like you said, he was a kid that's come over from Britain can all of a sudden change the way American TV works and can change the balance of American TV forever. No, but what I'm saying is he was a big yeah. star at the time. Right. Okay. He, he had had a hugely successful, you know, film, Four Weddings and a Funeral, which was worldwide a very, you know, very successful film. So he was very well known. Another thing you mentioned is Jay's love of Steve Irwin as was one of his favorite guests did the audience react better to british and australian guests as opposed to american guests and i also want to bring up rove mcmanus who you also had on the tonight show a few times who was the last person here to host a a, a tonight show esque kind of show he hosted it for 10 years here yeah well steve irwin let's just say that uh, he and jay formed a special bond and and steve was i mean he was he actually was he became a worldwide star in in his own right uh with 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 his absolute you know enthusiasm for animals and passion for animals and we early on formed a relationship he and jay bonded they became friends jay had always liked having animals on the show i i refer to animals as our secret weapon they always did incredibly well in ratings, they, they often the ratings that that having animal guests on often fa- far surpass those of major Hollywood celebrities. So uh, you know the uh, you know the idea of having Steve Irwin, who again was a star in his own right, and then, and coming on with animals, um, it, it was an incredible combination. And again, um, he the Tonight Show was his favorite late night show he always did our show whenever he came to the states i don't even think he did letterman when he did pass on jay spoke at his funeral and wrote his obituary for time magazine so did did you find there was a difference in audience reaction when you had australian or british guests on as opposed to local american guests i uh, my feeling about um australians 
and Brits is that, uh, and I'm speaking not just for myself, but all of my colleagues at the show, we would, we would have, there would be like a huge sigh of relief because you knew when you had a Brit on or someone with an accent from the empire, the British empire, that they weren't going to take themselves that seriously. They would be easy to work with, and Americans just took to them. They Somehow, when a British person or an Aussie tells something, it's intrinsically more interesting to Americans. <laughs> That's a good thing. <laughs> it's a wonderful thing. And again, you, you almost, I can't, think uh, i'm 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 trying to think back on a british actor that was like you know um had an attitude problem or hard to work with and none of them is coming to mind they were easy to work with and they were great storytellers much better as a group much better storytellers than americans another story you tell in the book was when Howard Stern came on the show, and you mentioned you're not a big fan of Howard Stern, and I completely understand why I kind of agree with you in that he's too outrageous and he's even rude and vulgar and that doesn't really have a spot in entertainment I don't think I mean I admire him for his ratings but he's not he's not clean like if you can be an entertainer and be clean then you you I think you're much more talented but what's the balance in having on guests and appealing to their audience as well as appearing to the tonight show's audience I get that it's a fine line and let me give you a little background uh, about Howard Stern. In the early days, Howard Stern was a friend of our show. He was a big supporter of Jay, because when we first went on the air, um, we, we had gotten a lot of flack from American television critics uh, that we, you know, Jay wasn't in the same league as Johnny Carson, and, and Howard would, you know, was always supporting Jay and saying, you know, get over, get over yourselves. Jay Leno does a terrific job. I'm a Jay Leno guy. And so Howard had always been really a friend of the show and had been a regular guest. But, the, the, but as you know, Howard relies on um, shock. You know, he was a shock jock, right? The problem is he tried to do his show on our show, right? So he, the, the night we had a big problem with Howard, he pulled off a stunt which he didn't share with any, he didn't share with Jay or the producer or anyone at the show. So he comes on the show, he brings a couple of, I, I don't know, porn stars, hides them in his dressing room, and then goes out on the stage and says, Jay, I am going to stage the first lesbian kiss in the history of late night television. Now, we, we have to go back to the mid-90s, Right. Something like this had never happened. So then all of a sudden, these two women come out, unbeknownst to any of us on the stand. Again, Howard had hidden them in the bathroom in his dressing room. Jay didn't know these women were going to come out and stage a lesbian kiss. I put that in quotes because <laughs> they were porn stars. And, you know, Jay always worked clean. That wasn't his image. That was Howard's image. And uh, it, it, it just wasn't pretty because Howard was trying, again, when you're on somebody else's show, you have to play by their rules. And Howard was playing by Howard's rules. So it didn't work well. So what is that balance between appe appealing to the newer audience that may not watch The Tonight Show, but they're watching it because you have that specific guest on, but also appealing to your regulars who, know, who kind of know what to expect? Yeah, you still have to respect the rules and, 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 and the way that a show operates. It's not cool to come on somebody else's show, br bring on two, as I said, women from the porno industry, and say you're going to stage the first lesbian kiss in the history of late night television without even telling the host or the producer. That's not cool. There, there's certain rules you have to abide by. You only ever supplied a helicopter escort for one guest who, who was Dennis Rodman. And you even, I like this, t this chapter. I didn't know what to expect just from reading the heading of the chapter, but it was a great chapter. You stalked him to Nashville to make sure he didn't miss his Tonight Show because he was not, his Tonight Show appearance because he was known for being late. Why was he, of all people, worth the trouble? Well, again, you, ha you kind of have to go back in time to, to uh, 
understand the significance of Dennis Rodman, who was a huge NBA basketball star at the time. And if you go back to that period of time, the single most famous and recognizable person in the world was a guy named Michael Jordan, um, a, a, a huge star for the Chicago Bulls basketball team. And the second biggest, most famous person in the world was Dennis Rodman, for whatever reason, maybe because he was just crazy. But um, so Dennis always assured us of great ratings. So that's why we bent over backwards to accommodate him. Was was he different to any other kind of actor or athlete or politician that came on? Because, because you had great ratings for, what was it, like 18, 18 or 20 years. Why, why him? Because he actually made a spike and he actually made a difference in the ratings. He didn't just, the, the ratings weren't just, you know, average when he came on. They went up. There was some kind of appeal that Dennis had to people. Maybe it's because they didn't know what he was going to do. I'm not sure. He would always wear the most outrageous out, outfits. He would spend six, seven, eight thousand dollars $8,000 on these crazy outrageous outfits whenever he did the show. If we stick with athletes just for a moment, as, as a show, you ruined your relationship with Kobe Bryant and Tiger Woods because you made jokes at their expense when they were going through controversies. Is it worth losing out on a good guest permanently uh, just to make a relevant joke about them in the monologue? Is, is that something you regret? That, I, I'm, I'm not sure I, anyone could ever answer that question, except that's what you do in late night. You make fun of newsmakers, uh, people who are in the news, and if you examine the jokes, they're not coming to me. They weren't really that bad. I mean, it, Jay wouldn't have been doing his job if he didn't if he, if he hadn't done jokes on the biggest controversy of the day. And the first one, uh, I'll refer to uh, Tiger Woods. Most people might remember that. You know, when he hit a tree and he was apparently drunk and his wife came after him with a golf club because of his infidelities, right? How, you can't ignore that story. You, you, you can't leave that out of the monologue. It's like a newspaper ignoring the big story of the day because they, didn't, they don't want to offend someone. You, you can't do it. And again, the jokes were pretty mild. But that's, that's your opinion, though, I guess. Like, it could, that may not be their opinion. It depends how they feel. I, I, I admit, if you can't take a joke, then it, you, you've got to kind of tough, tough it out a little bit. But did you ever come from it from their perspective and, and just think how, that, how they might have felt? Yes. And we, we made the decision that, that, uh, that Jay, Jay, who was best known for his monologue, couldn't leave out a story like Tiger, like Tiger Woods. He couldn't do it. You know, if I may say, we had a special relationship with Tiger Woods. I had developed a relationship with him long before he was a famous worldwide golfer. I had formed a relationship with him when he was, uh, when he was playing golf at Stanford University. He wasn't even a professional. Because I, I, you know, I had heard about him, and I, I felt like, okay, this is the, this is the future. This guy's going to be huge. We had cultivated this relationship. So believe me, I, I was really feeling the pain over that one. If we move on to uh, comedy guests, watching Jay's interview with Robin Williams and Billy Crystal, missing Robin is an obvious feeling, but do you miss those days in the early 90s when there was so much talent in the entertainment industry and especially in comedy? I mean, it, it must have been easy for you to kind of kind of pick guests, be, guests because the, the American comedy in dis, industry was so deep back in the early 90s. Well, that was the halcyon days. And, you, you know, everything, including show business, comes in cycles. But that was the halcyon days. And whenever you had a guest, uh, I think you mentioned... Was it Billy Crystal and Robin Williams? Yep. When, whenever there was a guest like that, it was pretty much like the producer would go, oof, I can take the day off, R right? Because you, you, you don't have the burden of trying to come up with clever questions, helping Jay formulate clever questions and ideas on what to do with the guest. Because, you know, it, it, with someone like Robin Williams, push button and he does it, right? He was just so brilliant. And the same with Billy Crystal. Yes, I, I, I do miss those days. So one 
if we stick with comedy just for, for another moment, my one disappointment about the book is that you didn't tell a story about one guest who I thought was very influential and the only guy to make Jay fall off his chair. You didn't tell me a story about Rodney Dangerfield. Do you have one off the top of your head? Yeah, and the only reason I didn't tell a story about Rodney is I didn't work with him. Oh, really? R- right. He was not a guest who I worked with. Of course, I was there whenever he came on, and Jay had enormous respect for Rodney, who was a regular guest on the show, right You know, right up until he died. Uh, he was a friend of the show, and, and uh, you know, he was uh, someone that, that we, we, we all admired and was a very, very kind, very nice man. I, I want to uh, stick with comedy. Right, Who was your favorite I'll comedian? I'll just throw out a story about Rodney since you brought it up. He <laughs> liked to hang out in the dressing room with his shirt off. I don't know why. <laughs> He'd just take his shirt off. <laughs> He just he just felt comfortable. No, that, that's a good thing though. That that that's a credit yeah. to you guys. Yeah. So who was your favorite comedy guest? Because you you talk a lot about politicians in the book as your favorites. Who was the comedian that stood out to you? Well, I uh, you have to tell me if this name resonates for you. But I had a I felt very close with Larry the Cable Guy. I know of his name. I haven't watched a lot of his stuff, but I do know his name. Okay. Uh, I liked Larry because he was. He was basically playing a character. He was playing a hayseed sort of a character. That he wasn't that person. He was actually a very. He's actually a very brilliant guy. But let me throw out another name. Does Does Don Rickles mean anything? I know Don Rickles. I love Don Rickles, and he had he had come from the old era. He had, you know, he had on he had uh, been a big star during the time of um, Frank Sinatra, and he was really the first comedian who did insult comedy. Very influential, really influenced a lot of comedians to, to this day who do, who do that style of comedy. It all started with Don Rickles. Right. Okay, that's interesting. Who was the nicest man in the world. And he, he, also, did a lot of, uh, he also did a lot of appearances on Letterman as well, so he must have gone around the whole late night scene. He, 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 did, he did appear on Letterman, yes. He did, but he felt an affinity for The Tonight Show because he had done Johnny Carson along with his buddies, Frank Sinatra and, you know, that whole crowd. Uh, and he had had his own show on NBC, that, that you know, uh, on NBC. So I think he felt more at home doing our show. But, yes, he did do Letterman as well. But it's <laughs> funny because, uh, you know, he was an insult comic. He said a lot of uh, jokes that were very politically incorrect. Um, he would tell ethnic jokes, which is, are not politically correct at all, which made us all very nervous, but he did it, and everybody thought they were funny. Did he run them by you before the show? Don, uh, Don Rickles, and one of the reasons we on this staff, and I personally like Don, he was completely in the moment. I always tried to you know, come up with questions for him, but he, he just said, I'm not giving you anything because I'll think of it when I'm out there. That, that's what a good comedian does. <laughs> I know, but and, and a guy in his 80s, he's coming mm. up with spont, you know, spontaneity on the spot. You tell a story about how Dr. Phil expected to get Jay on his show for an exclusive interview when Jay was fired in 2009, but instead Jay went on Oprah with the exclusive and Dr. Phil got, got really angry about it. Is that comp- competitive nature still alive when these celebrities can announce anything on social media? I think it is. It's just a very competitive business. And we had promised Dr. Phil that the next show that that Jay was going to do would be his show, Dr. Phil's show. But in the meantime, after we had made that promise, our, our show ran into a rough patch, a very rough patch, where we didn't know what our future would be. In fact, we thought we wouldn't even have a future. And that's when NBC had placed Jay Leno in a different time slot, prime time, had taken him off the Tonight Show and put him on the Jay Leno show in prime time and replaced Jay on the Tonight Show with Conan O'Brien. Both shows did horribly bad in the ratings, really bad. And we thought as a show, NBC was going to yank us and we were all going to be out of work. Um, However, NBC made a decision that they wanted to bring Jay Leno back to The Tonight Show in place of Conan O'Brien. And the press went ballistic, and Conan went ballistic, that somehow Jay Leno was 
big footing Conan O'Brien and was responsible for, for pulling him off the air when Jay never had the power to do that. Jay was not an executive at NBC. It wasn't his decision w- what he was going to do. And Jay needed to tell that story to the public, and the best place to do it was Oprah. That's interesting. So it was really, really competitive, not even just through the late night shows, but also through the daytime shows like Dr. Phil and Oprah. Yeah. So did the introduction of social media make it harder to get the quote unquote exclusive interview over Letterman because everyone could just start posting news instantly? I mean, social media came in around the time Ellen started, around the time Jimmy Kimmel started. Did that make it harder to get the, the exclusive interview? I don't think so, because we glommed on to social media right away, as soon as it came out. And by the way, the current uh, late-night hosts have done a terrific job of incorporating um, social media into their jokes, into their comedy bits. They've done a really good job. But we would just use social media as a source to ask questions of guests. You know, you are reported on blah, blah, blah website as saying this, can you comment on that? Because we know that on social media, you can't always rely on them. They're, it's not like they're a legitimate journalistic source. Yeah, true. Or, um, it was actually an oppor- It gave us an opportunity to ask questions where we never would have asked questions. Because, you know, it's not cool to ask questions based on rumor, which a lot of social media is just rumor. Unless it's but coming since from them. It was on social media, we could say, look, do you want to clear this up? It's on social media that you did such and such. Unless it's coming from their actual account. Right. So, so is there a balance between them announcing stuff on their actual account as opposed to going on a Tonight Show these days? Has that kind of shifted or is TV still in front of social media? For, for the, for the uh, guests themselves, you mean? Yes. Yeah, so, so for announcing their I, big I, news. I think that um, um, the, the, the entertainers of the world have uh, uh, used both social media and late-night shows together, and where they'll put on their, their social media website, watch me on Jimmy Fallon tonight, I'm going to be announcing a big project. And then the next day they tweet about it and put it on their website, here's what I said on Jimmy Fallon last night. You, you talk in the book about Conan's declining ratings and that Jay Leno got blamed for stepping into it because... Even Jay, because even Jay Leno's, the Jay Leno show didn't have great ratings, but he still got the Tonight Show back. Why is there such an emphasis on the show before the Tonight Show? I would think that the Tonight Show would be able to demand a big audience, no matter what's on before it or after it. It should be its own entity. And, and I agree with you. And that's exactly what we did when Jay was the host. He was the host of The Tonight Show, the number one rated show, even when NBC's ratings were in the tank, that were, were, like, were, were like below, the, um, were like in fifth and sixth place in terms of network ratings. No matter who came on before Jay, he kept the ratings at number one. Conan had no excuse. I mean, I, I love Conan. I'm a huge fan of Conan and his comedy, sure. but why... What did he do differently to Jay, or was it just his style? Because it's a bit more out there, and a bit more, uh, ex, ex, a bit more, not extravagant, a bit more eccentric. Is that why it didn't quite work out? Well, here's the thing: um, NBC executives had been working with Conan and suggesting to Conan that when he moved into late night, when he moved into the Tonight Show slot, he would have to make his comedy more mainstream. He did a lot of random humor that sort of appeals to 21-year-old um, young men. And he had this sort of quirky comedy, and, but the executives were, were telling him, okay, that works on a late, late night show, but for a mainstream audience, you're going to have to work on your comedy a little more. And he never did. Jimmy Fallon, on the other hand, was able to step right into it and move into mainstream because he understood he was moving into a different audience. Well, you mentioned Jimmy Fallon and, and, and his comedy. I think b- because The Tonight Show is more... I think t- The Tonight Show has become more of an international show because it's aired all, all around the world and you can watch it online as well. I think Jimmy Fallon's problem is that his comedy is too related to America. It's not branching out to in- international things. Is that an issue that 
can be worked on, or is it still aimed at the American audience? I, I have had always thought, even when I was producing that we weren't taking the international audience into account. I actually think that's a legitimate criticism. I mean, even to the point where when when I was booking guests and I would suggest the Prime Minister of Great Britain, I would uh, my colleagues would say, "No, nobody cares about him." Well, <laughs> uh, I think they do. I think I think this is a different. This is a world, uh, and so I think late night shows are missing the boat. I think they're missing the boat. And I remember I came up with lots of international names um, that that they that our show wasn't interested in doing. And I, I think I think you I think that's a legitimate criticism of Jimmy Fallon. As a comedy late night show, you did you, you talk a lot about politics because that's one of your favorite topics and one of Jay's as well. And you had a lot of politicians on who were announcing different things and who were making a big difference in America. As a comedy late night show, was it hard for you to comprehend that what happened on the show could become newsworthy overnight or that you could even change the public's political persuasion with a successful interview? Was was that a, a scary power to have? We learned it very quickly, uh, and it was particularly with the political guests. When you would have you know, presidential candidates... Um, doing the show, and then we had to set up a studio, a separate studio with the traveling press, with 200 people in the traveling press in a separate studio uh, watching the show and, re- and, and reporting on it right after we did it. It, 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 it's, uh, it you know, it, that, that was unknown. To, we, we had never experienced anything like that, and it was a little scary. Were, were you careful not to try and persuade the public's perception but? just to let the politician talk rather than you trying to push them into a corner and say what you want them to say? No, I don't think we ever tried to push them in a corner and and say what we wanted them to say. But here's what happened. When we did the show, um, with uh, particularly with comedians, in this era of political correctness, we had an agreement with uh, an understanding with our comedians that if they were going for a joke and they said something that would offend a certain group of people, but they were going for a joke and not trying to offend, but they would make a mistake, we would agree to edit it out, right? So yeah. that they would feel comfortable that they could come on our show. And if they just made a mistake, because it's so easy to say the wrong thing in this day and age, but we couldn't do that with political guests. So that when we booked President Obama, as the first sitting president ever to do a late-night show when we booked him, and that was on his 59th day in office, he said a faux pas. He said something really politically incorrect. He said that his bowling score was was about at the level of the Special Olympics. I read that part in the book, yeah. (laughs) I remember that. Right? So after the show... um, you know, it, it's, uh, you know, the press picked it up first, you know, because like I said, there's like 200 people in the other room. And, and um, the first reaction of, you know, the, the powers that be at the show is, oh, we better edit that out of the show to, to help the president. Right. And I'm going, no, you can't edit out of the show what a president said. The press is already knows what he said. They know what he said. Um, let's let's call the president and, and, and get his take on it. But he's not going to want to, you can't do that. You can't, in this case, you can't edit something to help protect the president. It actually makes it look worse. So I called uh, President Obama's people. He was already on Air Force One flying back to Washington, D.C. And I told them, hey, you know, the president said this thing about the Special Olympics, and they said, yeah, we know, we've been talking about it. And I said, well, you know, at the Tonight Show, they want to edit out the remarks, right? And his, his press people go, no, don't edit what the president said. Do not edit what he said. We will deal with it from our end. And then, so if, if that you, was the you, first yeah. thing we learned. You can't edit what a politician says, even if you're trying to protect them. And if you edit it out, it's going to look bad on you because the the, the media is going to blast you for editing out what the president said. They're going to blast us, and they're going to they're going to blast the president or whoever the person was. So we quickly learned that um, you know when you have people that are newsmakers on the show, whatever they say goes out. 
Yeah, see, it, it would be a really sc- scary power to, power to have. Yeah. yeah. And I, I felt bad for President Obama because he, like any comedian, was trying to go for a joke, right? He didn't mean to offend people in the Special Olympics. So how long did that backlash last for him? Was it a big he, uproar? They handled it. They handled it perfectly. They called the Special Olympics, the head of the Special Olympics, from Air Force One. As he was flying back to Washington, D.C., uh, he called and apologized to the Special Olympics. By the next morning, you know, in the news cycle, it was a non-story because the Special Olympics reported that the president called and apologized, and they accepted the apology. You mentioned that you had a lot of friends in the industry, which even included some high-profile guests. You mentioned Tiger Woods and Dennis Rodman you also said you were good friends with. Where do you see the line between friend and acquaintance in the entertainment industry? I think mostly you you don't have friends in the entertainment industry. You have people who you work with. um, But over time, you can't help but form strong relationships with guests, many of whom I worked with for up to almost two decades. I I wouldn't say I had that many friends, but I did have good relationships with, with a lot of people. So where, where, did, where did you see you had to draw the line between, you know, being able to have a good chat with people that came on the show, which you'd be able to do with almost anybody, and also on the odd occasion saying, hey, let's go out for lunch? Were there many um, people you could, ask, you could call and ask that to? Oh, I could have asked anybody to go out to lunch, but just so you know, in the, in the time that I worked at the show, I never went out to lunch once. It, it, just to answer that question, it was a crisis environment. You could never leave while you were there. We all had working lunches. The producers would sit around a table with Jay Leno and we would have lunch and we would talk about that day's show. But to answer your question directly, um, I had no problem um, having friendships with anybody. It's, be, doing an entertainment show is not like having a relationship as a journalist interviewing somebody. It was different. You could have friends and, and, and it would be okay. My favorite line, I'm really excited about this question, my favorite line in the book is in regards to Jay wanting to have a look at your old bomb of a van. You wrote, Jay immediately took off for the parking lot at his usual pace, which is twice as fast as a speed walker. I had to read that a few times just to take it in. If you were describing him to an outsider like me, is that the sentence or trait that you'd start with? I think I would, uh, I would, I, I would, in fact, that's how, when I go out and give talks, I always say that Jay had an attention span of about 10 seconds. He just did. He didn't have a, um, he, you know, you know, he was fast. He, he, I, I, he often said he thought he maybe had ADHD. He was dyslexic. People who are dyslexic sometimes don't have much of an attention span. And he was fast. He was quick. You, you, had, you had to sort of, you know, pick it up when you're trying to talk with him or deal with him. Was that annoying or was that kind of his goofy little trait? I think it was his goofy little trait and it actually served the show well because when you're doing a daily comedy show, you don't have a lot of time to spend on any given topic. So he was able to, you know, stay on point um, and you had to... You learned to stay on point if you were dealing with him because you knew he had a very short attention span. Towards the end of the book, you talk about Jimmy Fallon's weakness as interviewing. To me, it seems like all the late night shows follow this kind of similar for- format. Do do you think that th- that that's true? Do you think the Tonight Show has kind of lost some of its prestige, partly because it's it's, I think it's aiming for people who are looking for their 15 minutes of fame, partly because a lot of it's made for social media and partly because there, there is such uh, a deep... There's, there's a lot of talk shows out there now. Do you think that The Tonight Show's kind of lost? I like to use the word prestige, but is that the kind of word you agree with? Well, I'm, I'm not quite sure what you're asking, but, but I would say and you tell me if I'm not going in the right direction, I would say the, the Tonight Show has maintained its prestige because Jimmy Fallon has done such an excellent job of relating today, to, to today's millennials. Even though I would, I would say, as I did in the book, that his interviewing skills are a bit weak. 
But that that's kind of what all interviewing things are about. It's all interviewing styles are about in these late night shows. It's more about promoting what the guest is there for rather than getting a little bit of an insight that you, that you can in the 10 minutes that they're on the show into their life that the public wouldn't necessarily know about. Actually, we make promoting, we always made promoting as, um, as unimportant as we could. What we did is we booked a guest with the understanding that, uh, you know, after they did the interview, they could promote their project, whether it was a movie or a book or a television show or that they were running for office, whatever it was. The, pr- promoting was not the major part. In, in exchange for them appearing on the show, we would promote their product. But that was never the main part of any interview. See, so today it, it, it seems like promoting their product is the main part of their interview, and I think that's why The Tonight Show has lost some of its... I like to use the prestige, the word prestige. Oh, okay, so you you would disagree with me. Okay, okay I get it. Um, yeah, I, I see what, what you mean. I just think that Jimmy Fallon has done su- such a great job of taking actors and using them at what they do best, which is performance. Now, when you come on The Tonight Show, you have, often you're asked to do a lip-sync contest or play a silly game or do something, and it's very entertaining. But, it's, but he doesn't do the interviews so much. Um, he doesn't emphasize that as much as some of the other hosts. So why, even, so why does he still main, how does he still maintain top ratings when Jay Leno had top ratings doing something completely different? Is that because times because have changed? J- Jimmy has reformulated, has re- reinvented the show that seems to work with today's millennial audience. It's not so much about the monologue as it was with Jay. It's not even so much about the interview, but the guests come on. Many of them have a relationship with Jimmy, and they do a performance. The lip sync contests, or, or, or you know, there's any number of things that he does. Um, the audience finds those really entertaining. Well, I, I, I watch. I know you're a, um, a a talk show, a bit of a talk show buff. I've read that, and I also am as well. I, if you compare it to someone like, I don't know if you watch much of Graham Norton in the UK. I, I haven't seen Graham for a while. But he, his style is he has the, he has three guests on all at once, and he bounces between them and connects them all together. But he also asks a lot about their history, even though they're obviously there to promote their their thing, and they, he shows a clip of it like Jay used to do. But he still uses that that for, that same format as Jay kind of kind of did. So is it is it because it's a different audience in the UK or di- was it necessary to update the tonight show do you think? Well, I think each host comes in with their own style. And I think um th- that's what's really going on. In the case of Jimmy Fallon, he was a great performer on Saturday Night Live. Yeah, he's, he his have, performing is his strength. Th- that that was his background. He was a great entertainer. He can sing, he can dance, he can he can do bits. He he's he's a, he's a great impressionist, uh, and so that's his strength. And he's playing to his strengths. And yeah, even if you look, at, I think Conan's a much better interviewer than Jimmy. But I, I guess he is it, a better interviewer. It's, it's he a is. different. It's a different audience. Yeah, Conan's a better interviewer, but Conan Conan's not a major player. He doesn't have anywhere near even a million viewers. So who who are the major yeah. players these days? Jimmy Fallon. But Jimmy Fallon is the king of late night and has been from day one when he went on the air. Was Craig Ferguson any anywhere near him, or Letterman when he finished up? Was Letterman anywhere near him? Um, here's what happened: Jimmy Fallon knocked David Letterman out of the box right at the start. I think what Letterman wanted to do after Jay Leno left the Tonight Show. I think he wanted to stay on and finally achieve that position that, that, that had so long eluded him. He wanted to be number one in late night. But once Jimmy Fallon came on the air, Letterman didn't have a chance. The audience immediately took to Fallon. And by the way, you mentioned Ferguson. He's one of my all-time favorites. Were his ratings anywhere near the Tonight Shows? Or no. Is, is, he, he, was, um, he, was in, he didn't have a late night show. He had a late, late night show he followed letterman but he was an acquired taste he was wonderful though he if anybody approached spontaneity it was him 
true spontaneity on a consistent basis. How far behind Fallon is Jimmy Kimmel or Stephen Colbert? Yeah, okay. Stephen Colbert is, it's almost like Leno to Letterman is like Fallon to Colbert. Fallon's audience is like, I don't know, three and a half to 3.8 million. And he not only has that, he gets a lot of hits on social media, far more than, um, than, than Colbert and Kimmel, although they both do well in social media. They all do well in social media. And I think that's the strength of today's late night shows. But anyway, um, so Colbert comes in second. He, he comes in with like 2.8 million. Fallon has about 3.8 million. And Kimmel has 2.5 million. But each of them has their strength. Colbert's a, str- uh, you know, a very good interview, particularly with the political guests. And I think Kimmel is getting stronger and stronger and stronger. I think he's the dark horse. He could really go all the way. I, I, we'll have to see. And, yeah, you mentioned that Jimmy Fallon is really good at doing social media, but it takes away from that, like I mentioned earlier, that big interview that you used to get over Letterman or over anyone else because people can go on social media and they can draw attention to it. But The Tonight Show used to be its own entity. It didn't really need any other promotion because it was The Tonight Show. Is that a different environment now that social media is used as advertising but is also used as promotion if they're different things? I think you have to deal with the cards that are dealt to you. And in this day and age of social media, you have to incorporate it into what you're doing. And um, the, the networks are figuring out how to monetize social media. It doesn't pay as well as on air, but they're doing it. They're, they're you know, they're running ads. So you, you have to deal with, so you can't avoid social media, but it has changed the game. In a good way or a bad way? <laughs> it's just changed the game. <laughs> but, I, but, I, in, but I have to say, the late night shows are still very relevant. They've adapted to social media. It's just that you, you might have audiences that relate in a different way. The millennials may not watch the whole show. They may just watch this bit or that bit or this guest or that guest. Now, you've got this incredible book which was released about 18 months ago and it's called Behind the Curtain, An Insider's Look at Jay Leno's Tonight Show. What have been some of the best reactions to it? Are people more interested in the celebrity side rather than the behind-the-scenes aspect? I try to avoid the celebrity side because the interviews that I've watched have focused more on the celebrities rather than the behind-the-scenes aspect, which is a bit more what I'm interested in. But how have you seen the reaction? Oh, I, I'm happy to answer any question that, that you want on, on any aspect of it. I think people do like, they, they sort of do like to hear the stuff that, that happened uh, backstage. They like hearing what kind of a guy was, was Jay Leno really. I, I think they do like those questions. They, they do like those. But of course, you know, my, you know, I love telling political stories because I came from that world. So I emphasize those stories. Have you, have you had a, a good reaction to it worldwide? Or have you had some people that are mentioned in the book come to you and say, look, can you change this bit about me? I really haven't had a negative reaction because early on I made a decision that I wasn't going to speak negatively about the guests. Um, and if I had any regrets about the book, it's that, uh, that there were some negative things that I said um, because my overall feeling about the guests is I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm not anti-Hollywood. I'm not anti-actor. If it wasn't for the guests on the show, we, we, we couldn't have had a show. We, had, we relied on them. So my only regret about the book is Maybe I was a little too negative towards certain guests backstage. And oh, before we go into the last question, you, men- you mentioned towards the end of the book that it was a stressful 18 years because you have to be really quick at what you do. But what was your favorite memory? You mentioned John, I think it was John F. Kennedy when he came on the show. Do you have any other big memories that stand out to you, whether it be a guest or whether it be something else? I think, you know, an outstanding moment is... And it, it's, it's almost hard to understand this story unless you put it in the context, is when we booked um, President Obama as the first sitting president ever to do a late night show uh, and seeing him actually walking into the building with his, you know, retinue of Secret Service agents. Now, we had had him on the show several times before that, first when he was an author, next when he was a senator, then when he was a presidential candidate. But when a guy comes in, and he has president in front of his name, and now he has 40 Secret Service agents. 
Four of them are, you know, have rifles and they're up on top of the building as sharpshooters, as opposed to the last time he was on the show and he had two Secret Service agents. And now you call him President Obama instead of Mr. Obama or instead of Senator Obama. That was a really special moment. It was almost... It was almost, a, it was, for me, literally an out-of-body experience, which I had originally written into the book, but my wife said, that's so unbelievable, take it out. What, what do you do now? Are you still friends with Jay? Are you happy to stay away from the television environment, or are you on, on, the, on the edge of retirement? What, what do you do now? Uh, it's just that I don't have a day job anymore. I take stuff as they come along. I, these days I write jokes for people, mostly people in the political world, now, if you had told me when I was a kid growing up in South Chicago that I could actually make a living writing jokes for people, I would have said, what, are you crazy? But I, I write jokes for people. I write, um, I, wrote a, I write a column for a newspaper. I write uh, freelance columns. And I have a couple of other book projects that I'm working on. And I go around giving speeches. Do you still keep in contact with Jay? Uh, I do not a lot, but... Um, the last time I saw him was in Washington, D.C. I, I had booked him to do a performance for the First Lady, Michelle Obama, which he very graciously did. But, uh, I, but um, it's not like I stay in touch with him every week. You mentioned that you were close to him on the show because you shared that interest in, in politics. But again, I guess that's more of an acquaintanceship rather than a friendship. See, that, it's the balance of that word because I know friends are really rare in that industry good friends. Oh, I see what you mean. Yeah. No, it's a, you, you don't, you know, when you're dealing with a celebrity, you never want to take advantage of that. But part of when you're the underling, as I was, and Jay is the celebrity, you never want to take advantage of that. So if he wants to reach out to me, that's wonderful. But I don't want to sort of take liberties and reach out to him unnecessarily. Exactly. That's... Because you want to respect him and his privacy. Are you Facebook friends with him? <laughs> no. Uh, no, I'm not. No? Uh, okay. But I, but I have all of his contact information, and if I wanted to call him right now, I could. I could reach him anywhere. Dave, it's, it's been an absolute pleasure. I hope I haven't kept you for too long. I got a good insight into how The Tonight Show worked under Jay Leno, and I do like discussing, obviously, how... The, uh, the late night show industry works these days. So I hope you enjoyed it and good luck with wherever life takes you from here on out. I really enjoyed it. You asked a lot of thoughtful questions and I, which I appreciate.